You are not alone among oboists if cane quality is of concern for you. This week's burning reed making topic in the Oboe Reed Master series is cane. In preparation for the upcoming live and interactive Zoom read room sessions, I interview Andrew Angus from Australia, this week's Oboe Reed Master. Later this week, he will join the dynamic read makers in the Zoom read room during which he will concentrate on cane and cane quality. I'm Janine Krause from JK Double Read Making and your host for the Oboe Read Master series. I want you to hang out with the world's best read making experts and find out how they solve burning read issues. So follow the link to stay in the loop. I came to know Andrew Angus through his lively Oboe Read Making Forum. He has been so generous in sharing his delight and his expertise with oboe reed makers all over the world. He performs on modern and historical oboes with such ensembles as the Australian Brandenburg Orchestra, the Melbourne Bach Ensemble, and the Bach Academy. He has appeared at many festivals, including the Melbourne International Festival. Andrew has recorded for ABC Classics and Naxos. He produces and sells oboe reeds commercially and copiously about 1,500 reads a year. You can find his reads at sweetreads.com. It's midday here in Hofheim, near Frankfurt, Germany, and I am so pleased to welcome Andrew, who is taking a moment before his evening meal to answer a few questions. So welcome, Andrew. Start by telling us where you are. Yes, hi, I live in a small city called Ballarat, which is an hour and a half north of Melbourne in Victoria at the bottom end of Australia. So it's about noon here. What time is it there? Yeah, it's 7.30 in the evening on Wednesday. Ideally, what do you want to feel like when you're playing the oboe? And what do you want to sound like? Yeah, the, 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 it's a, that's an excellent question. The, the feel for me is um, the instrument needs to feel like an extension of, of, of me. It's, um, for me, it's primarily an, an expressive tool. And um, so what I'm wanting to express um, needs to be able to come through the reed and come through the instrument very, very easily. With the many different oboes that you play, do you have a different set of priorities for these different oboes or do they stay basically the same with regard to reeds? The, that expressive element is certainly the same across all the different instruments. Um, sometimes the, the technical demands of the instrument can come to the fore. So there, there, yes, there can be some differences, yeah, depending on the instrument. So what would you say your read priorities are? What does a read really have to do? For me, primarily, it, um, it has to sing. That's the most important thing. It, um, again, it's related to that expressive requirement I have with the read. It, it, it needs to sing. It needs to, to say something to the audience. So that is the fundamental thing. Um, after that, yeah, there's a whole bunch of technical stuff that obviously needs to needs to work so that uh, everything everything works. So obviously tuning and um, uh, to some extent the blend need, needs to work with the other instruments and octaves need to need to be there. So there's there's all those other technical requirements underneath that. But primarily, yeah, it's the singing quality of the reed that is the most important thing for me. What's the very first thing that comes to mind when I say reed making? The, the, the joy of working with the raw material. It's, it's that, that incredible privilege of having the chance to handle the, the, the cane, this, this incredible material that looks so unassuming that, that, that at the same time holds all this incredible magic. I've been doing doing it full on now for a number of years, and that that magic hasn't hasn't gone. It's still it's still there, and um, that's what drew me to to get into it in the first place. And it's um, it's still very much there when I come to the reed making desk every day. So, how old were you when you had your first reed making lesson? 
<laughs> yeah, it was. I, I was in high school. I was probably seventeen, eighteen, I think. And um, um, yeah, I was loving my oboe playing, but I was horribly dependent on commercial reeds that I had to scrounge from whichever shop had them in stock. And um, so I managed to get onto this oboist who knew something about reed making. And I remember the first lesson, it was in front of his um, kitchen refrigerator. We used the handle of his refrigerator door to uh, anchor the, the thread for, for tying on. <laughs> I remember that very clearly. <laughs> Do you remember it being love at first sight? Yeah, there was a certain amount of excitement. Um, I think I remember being a little bit overwhelmed with how much knowledge there was and um, how many steps there were, how many potential points to trip up. So certainly all that, but it um, it didn't deter me. I remember going home and uh, and making a tentative start. <laughs> <laughs> just on the dining room table. The materials that we use tend to be grown in the French Riviera area. So do you find that being in Australia, you've had any difficulty with supplies? Not as such, no, no. There's um, enough reliable online sources of cane that um, as long as I plan, plan ahead enough, and order in advance. The distance doesn't seem to be an issue really. Uh, yes, it'd be wonderful to go and visit the cane fields in person and get a bit more hands on with the material, but um, no, the physical distance is, uh, is not generally an issue for me. What sort of time do you have to plan in as a cushion to have the materials that you need? It can be as short as two weeks. Uh, a month is more comfortable. What is the least enjoyable part of reed making for you? Ah, it's um, the least enjoyable, I think. That's, that's, that's a good question. I, I think it would be the least enjoyable. Because ah, they're, all, they're all so different, of course. Um, it's probably, if I had to single one out, it would be the, probably the tying on, I think. I think just because it's the, even though it's the point where it really starts to look like a reed, it's probably the, the most time consuming. What is your very favorite part of reed making? What do you enjoy about reed making? Whenever I get a chance to appreciate the the beauty of the material, the aesthetic qualities of the material. Um, and that could be at any point in the process. It could be when I'm just getting the tubes out of storage and getting ready to split the tubes. Um, it can be, the, the pre-gouging has a certain magic about it too. I love that process of removing the waste material from the inside and um, the, the, the shaping process as well, that, um, that can be a really enjoyable aspect too. Um, so it's all these different stages have these um, underlying kind of aesthetic elements to them. And um, for me, that's endlessly satisfying. And knowing that it's all getting one step closer to making a sound. This, this is the amazing thing. I, I always think that the, the oboe really is the reed. Um, so that every, every, every step along the process, um, I, I'm so aware that I'm creating a, this, this, this sound, this magical sound. And the instrument in some ways is just, um, just the amplifier of, of that sound. So um, yeah, it's just, 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 Lovely to go through all the all the various stages with the cane, appreciating its aesthetic quality, and knowing that you're handling something that's just bursting to want to start vibrating and make make amazing sounds. Does this mean that you have a very clear vision of what your finished product is going to be, even at the time when you're pulling out the tube cane? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yep. 
yep, I have a, a really clear picture of what those finished reeds look like sitting in their little storage rack, um, all with their beautifully profiled tips, their almost transparent tips. Um, that image is always in, in my mind as I'm going through those various stages. And it's certainly, it's certainly a motivator to get from the splitting, the pre-gouging, gouging, shaping, tying on, just to, to get to that final s stage. It's certainly very motivating to, to know that that reward is going to be at the end. So you've done a lot of teaching. What, in your opinion, is the biggest mistake that your students make with their reads? Excellent question. It's just not treating them with enough care. They, they actually get really good with the, the, the gouging, pre-gouging, splitting process. Um, mistake, I think mistakes tend to creep in for them when they go to tie the cane onto the staple. It's just, just technically more difficult, I think. Um, so there's a lot of mistakes creep in there, just where the binding is not really tight. Get a lot of air leaks, or it's, it's very wonky. And um, so most of my students' mistakes would creep in at the tying on stage. I've had to explain what wonky is to my European <laughs> uh, English as a second language people in the course. And every one of you has used the word. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems to be something often used in conjunction with, with oboe reeds. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a formal or informal set of absolute read truths? This is a concept that Caroline Park, who was at the time principal oboist of the Omaha Symphony, she taught me, she kept track of her read truths, not rules of thumb, but absolutes. Yeah. What has to happen for a read to be successful? For me, it's um, um, eliminating errors, minimizing errors in, in the process. Once you do that, you're well on the way to making a good read. I think a lot of reads don't turn out because there are errors somewhere in the process. If, if you eliminate those, it's got such, such an excellent chance of having a good read. Yeah, the other big read truth for me is releasing the sound. For, for me, it's all about releasing the sound that is already inherent in the piece of cane. Um, just let let the cane be itself. Let let it um, let it open up and get yourself out of the way of the piece of cane. Don't try and impose yourself too much on it. Um, so I think for me they're they're the two the two big truths for me when I'm making reads. What are your most important tools? I couldn't live without my profiler, reads and stuff profiler. It's um, become an extension of my hands. It's not, yes, it's not a reed knife as such, but it's really close to it. Um, um, so I think, I think that's probably the, the number one for me. And to go with it is sharp blades. The blades for it need to be really sharp and um, I'm, I'm constantly swapping them out and making sure because it's, it's um, all about the getting the, the tip of the reed really fine. Without that, it's, uh, it's not, not gonna work. So if I had to name one, it would, uh, yeah, it would be the profiling machine. Do you sharpen the blades yourself or do you send them back and have them? I can kind of sharpen them myself, but I find myself just buying new ones from time to time. They're a little bit, a little bit tricky to sharpen really effectively with the um, the curved curved shape of them. Do you have any really great read making stories, maybe spectacular failures or spectacular successes? If you'll allow it, it was um, getting one of my year 12 students uh, on, on board in the early days of starting up this read making business, um, teaching her how to make, make the reads. Um, she was involved in the, most of the stages at various points. Uh, I, for me, it was a big, big success. Um, taught me a lot about the process as well, having to explain it to, to somebody else. Um, my 
other big read-making success, I think, is um, the consistency I, I get with, if I make 100 reads, 95 of them will all turn out. It's important to know that I'm making making it for a broad market, so I'm making them for beginner beginner students right through to semi-professional, professional players. Um, so there's a reads that will cater for, for all those different players. But so yeah, out of out of those hundred reads, then all all going to be um, they'll suit a, a range of players. But they all they all work. They all crow straight off the machine. They all sound like oboe reads and um, um, it's uh, always really satisfying to, to get such a high uh, success rate. So, uh, yeah, I think that would be another one of my read successes. Um, plenty of failures too, for sure. <laughs> yeah, especially early on, trying to get that consistency, um, going through all those late night remaking sessions, just refining the process, how to handle the profiling machine, so that it would get consistent results. Um, um, so a lot, a lot of failures on, on the way, a lot of reads that um, didn't sound fantastic. Um, um, so yeah, definitely count those as, as failures in, in the early days. How important do you think good read making skills are for the success of your performing career? For, for me, it's important. The, the two go, for me, they go hand in hand um, as I'm making a read. As I've got to that final point, I'm actually testing the read. Um, I'll actually test it on orchestral excerpts and um, um, play on the read as if I was in in the orchestra um, playing that excerpt, or I'll sit there and just play a tuning A on on the read as if I was in the rehearsal in in the performance. Um, so in that sense, yeah, yeah, the um, the performing and the read making very much go hand in hand they're almost one and the same thing what is your read making superpower <laughs> yeah um i think it's i think it's the patience i bring to the craft um, um other people have commented on on the amount of patience i've got just in life generally to to deal with fiddly difficult tasks um i'm um probably end endlessly patient uh, quite often. And uh, perhaps that's a superpower. I, I know I know it's not unique. Other people have it. Um, I know a lot of people don't. And um, they'll gladly palm off their read making to me because I've got, I've got that ability to sit there and <laughs> spend hours and hours doing the task. So perhaps, perhaps that's it, I think. And attention to detail, I've got, um, yeah, I pride myself on, on my attention to detail. If you look back and regard your career up to this point, uh, read making or performing, what are you most proud of? Certainly with the performing, um, having performed professionally for, for a long time, um, there's, there's some wonderful highlights. Um, certainly playing with the Australian Brandenburg Orchestra up in, in Sydney. More recently in Melbourne, playing playing a lot of Bach, Bach cantatas and John Passion, um, B minor mass. Um, coming back to those works every every year is always really special and is always a real highlight for me. From the read making side, I think that's that probably what I feel is my big success is getting that level of consistency with with the the reads working out. You know, it's probably around yeah, it have to be at least around 90 percent. Congratulations. Those are some wonderful accomplishments. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's been such a pleasure to finally get to talk to you in person in this Zoom read room. Andrea, it's been such a joy to follow you through your forum. And uh, we're so much looking forward to having you with us for the two sessions with the Oboe Readmaster this, for this season. Thank you so much for Wonderful. joining me. Thank you so much.